everything else versus Bitcoin essentially gets spent and dies. I want to be able to have reactive security. And I think Opvault is today the most straightforward, easiest to use way to do that. I will not be insulted by a clockmaker. <laughs> Overall, these kind of ways to make the network easier to both build on and interact with, I think is a really big deal. If Bitcoin existed when we started Twitter, we would not have to go down the ad model path. I mean, as simple as that. Integrating Lightning into a social network is the killer app. Hello, and welcome to the Bitcoin.Review podcast, where we explore developments and projects with the people who actually make them happen. The show is supported by Pod 2.0, Sat Streaming, and Quenkai. If you're a new listener, I'm NVK. I run Quenkai, where we've been helping people secure their Bitcoins for over a decade. We make the cold card and fun products like the Block Clock. You can find more information about it on Quenkai.com. Hello, and welcome back to the Bitcoin Review. Today I have with me Mr. Rindell. Hello, great to be back. And Schmidty from Brink. Hi, everybody. And Optech. Yeah, and Optech. So yeah, we were just chit-chatting here. That uh, 57th episode, I think we've had over 100 guests now. And uh, this started uh, just a bit, uh, I think, earlier than maybe Optech, the voice calls. Well, congratulations. So, yeah, man, it's it's amazing. I think, like, you know, once you cross the second, third year of a pod, I mean, it's a pod, right? <laughs> it's no longer... Well, it's also like changed format a little bit because it used to only be the list episodes. And now you've also got like these panel episodes that are really good. And so it's 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 cool to see like the variety. Yeah, I mean, I've been I've been meaning to to do another panel episode, but like I've been failing to find I, I, I've i realized that I need to be like sort of like very into the topic to do the panel episode. Yeah. If I'm not really into it, then it's kind of like, man, I need to find something. Now, I, I know you set out you set out to bore the audience how have you how how do you think you've done i think that was the original intent is to provide boring bitcoin technical content do you think you've succeeded you know i think that part has been a huge success i've gotten uh, messages from people who told me that they almost crashed their cars because they were listening to it and almost fell asleep on the wheel that's i know it's good my wife still finds it that she will pass out very quickly if she listens to this before bed she won't get past like 10 15 minutes i mean i'm talking about like it's very effective I, I have a fear when when we're putting on a podcast with my wife that I might accidentally hit the Optech one and she might hear me speaking on a podcast, which is like a I, I don't even like listening to myself. <laughs> I don't I don't listen to myself either. On on the very first few shows I only like listened to to see you know, if the show sounded like decent, mm -hmm. I had my kids in the car. They're like, oh, it's daddy. <laughs> and they were actually entertained by it. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I refuse to listen to, to the pod. It's weird, man, to listen to yourself. It, yeah, I, I don't like the way I sound. And I have the unfortunate role of not only speaking on the Optech recap podcast that we do, but also as the editor. So then I'm, I have to listen to myself. Oh, God, no. Oh, can you imagine? No, you should talk to Johnny. Johnny is uh, is it's probably taking on more customers too. He he does a great job with the editing and stuff. I'm hoping AI can just do this one day. Yeah, he probably will. Yeah, the 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 ultimate vision for this pod, I think, is um, we take like the sparrow, we 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 take the sparrow release notes. That's right. Pipe it through text to speech, and that's the podcast. No, but he, here's even better. Like we can get like we invite each maintainer to come like read their own notes. Yeah. And then we train an AI and we have going forward the AI reading each of the release notes on the maintainer's voice. <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. Right? Yeah. And it's all automated. <laughs> like, you know, we, we, we have a script that pulls from GitHub, pushes into the thing, adds jokes based on some, you know, like randomized but trend bearing algo. Right. Yeah. That 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 like understand the no the, the the jokes are happening, so it's timely to whatever Twitter is doing. Uh, totally possible. You've seen the uh, chat that Bitcoin search, I think it is uh, that that Jonas has put out, where you can speak with merch. There, there's different trained per personalities. I think there's merch is one of them, and I think there's a few other different ones. And so yeah, I I, I tried that out pretty early on. I asked a uh, fee or like a transaction weight question for the merch bot because like 
Of course. You know, and, and it, it got it wrong and I was really disappointed, but I think it's gotten better. Yeah. You know, uh, building now uh, the Unleash.chat thing, yeah. I can tell you that, boy, oh boy, we're so far from like all the scaremongering of the Skynet stuff. Yeah. Man, the amount of mechanical turking, digital mechanical turking you have to do for these LLMs to have like any clue of actually like useful things is insane. You know, like OpenAI like sounds so amazing because like they hide all the mechanical turking, right? And it's all closed and they have like 5,000 people writing authoritative prompts so that it, it comes out the way that it looks. But like, it's just like, it's insane. And it, I'm going to get into some of that a little later. Well, good. That, that means we're, our podcasting hobbies are now preserved then for at least another year. That's right. Can you imagine being able to deprecate the amount of time that it takes to do this? And then we do this in just calls, private calls, mm -hmm. so that we can, uh, you know, still do all the shitting. And this is just therapy, really. This is male yeah. software therapy. <laughs> That's right. You get it out of your chest. How bad is Linux? You know? <laughs> Pulse audio is horrible. What's the meme that, that you know, Bitcoiners will start a podcast that, instead of going to therapy? A hundred percent. That is me right there. It's really funny. <laughs> All right. So uh, housekeeping. OpenSats announced 10 new grants. Clams. Fully noted. Validating. VLS. FedMint Lightning Getaway. The Picard Payment Plugin for Core Lightning. BitBanana. Crack the Orange. Bitcoin Core app, Crux and Vaxel. I have a question. Yeah. Every time I see clams, I think of the old <laughs> Bitcoin clams well, fork. What it, What is this clams? I can't remember. I'll forgive you. <laughs> like really, clams won't forgive you. But <laughs> let's let's go look. Let's go look. Dun, dun, dun. Clams, open source core lightning UI. Oh, I, I think it's kind of like a kind of like a Zeus, maybe like um. It's just like a, a remote control, maybe, or Core Lightning. Yeah, it's a browser UI for Core Lightning. That's cool because I mean, you can do. Um, there's RTL and there's Thunderhub, and like RTL works for LND and for CLN, but like Thunderhub, which was like a little bit slicker and more Ajaxy, yeah, only worked for LND. So it's nice to see more UI for CLN. All right. I have a meta question for you. You're you're part of OpenSats. Do you go through evaluating the applications at all? Or yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So we have ten board members, right? It takes a uh, like a, a quorum, right, to like a majority vote to to uh, to approve any application. Hmm. So an absence is a essentially a no, right? So, you know, we get a lot of applications and uh, I don't know how many now, like it, it's the volume is big. I mean, like, you know, it's a $10 million fund kind of thing. Right. So, you know, I'm not going to like read them all and participate in all of them. But like, you know, we all participate in quite a few of them. And we also have committees now. Right. So there's a Nostra committee that helps. So this, the, the Nostra committee will soft vote on something and then, you know, Mm. the the board would do sort of like a due diligence act or knack on, on the committee, but we want to respect the committee's vote. Cool. Same, we're going to have committees for other topics too, like Lightning Committee, Core Committee, that kind of stuff. It's better that way because then you have more domain experts sort of, you know, review applications. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Obviously, with, with Brink, we have a grand committee as well, but we're so focused on Bitcoin Core that... Mm. I guess in some respects, it's, it's easier to filter out things that aren't applicable. And I, I, I don't envy the, the breadth of knowledge that you all must need in order to evaluate this broader spectrum of, of grant applications. Yeah, I, I mean, like, you know, it's, it's good. I think personally, I think we need more division of labor in, in, the, in the funding orgs, you know, like so there is more focus. So, like, I think for open sats, the goal is is like, you know, it's more cold. It's not like so much like education and things like that. And there is definitely core long, long grants, mm -hmm. so that people can work full time on it for a long time. But you know that that's just one part, right? Uh, the Noster, so like essentially, like the Noster fund is like a slightly different way of looking at it because it, you know it's bootstrapping pack. Mm -hmm. It's more like you know trying to throw things in the wall and see what sticks, and so it's, it's like a very different thing. 
for Bitcoin things, it's more like, you know, necessary things, interesting new things. And I was going to say for the Nostra thing, it seems like it's a little bit more project based. Yeah. Like somebody wants a grant because they want to go build X on Nostra as opposed to I want a grant because I'm going to be working on Bitcoin privacy for the next year or something. Right. Exactly. On the Bitcoin, it's, it's more like specific people. Mm -hmm. uh, although like most of the time, the Nostra projects are still a specific person. Sure. And, and it's easier and better if people apply as as an individual. Uh huh. But, uh, but yeah, it seems like we're in a, a bull market for open source development grants. I mean, it still feels like single source uh, funding <laughs> for all the orgs. <laughs> it's it's true. <laughs> you, you know, it, it's OK. Uh, you, you know, like I, I just I just love that like Jack, like make this this puts like with like zero strings attached mm -hmm. for People maybe don't don't know and don't understand that. That's like really is like sort of like okay, I I, I like where you guys are going. Like here's cash and like go do it. Like there is there is zero influence. But it would be nice if we you know start getting some some decent chunks of cash from other entities. Uh, I can't, I don't know if Brink is five hundred one c three, but OpenSats is and it's tax deductible, right? So if you're a big corp, that depends on Bitcoin, mm -hmm. and instead of paying taxes, send send it to OpenSats. You know, much better use of funds. Yeah, Brink is five hundred one c three as well. Oh, cool. There's a yeah, in, in being in the Bitcoin world, of course, there's always some weird nuance to what we're doing, and I think there's even there's some folks working on being able to donate hash rate, hmm. like so you can pledge not the miner itself, not the physical miner, not the output of the miner, um, but the the future hash rate, and you can deduct from your taxes in this year, the output of that hash for up to three years. Wow. There's a group doing this with accounting and things like that. So it, it's actually advantageous to the miner. Sounds like something right for uh, IRS disruption. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's awesome. But it's pretty cool. I mean, like, you know, I hope people enjoy it for as far as they can. Exactly. Any, any chance to make direct, uh, like a direct change in society instead of going through government, like the better, right? No taxes, just full charity, right? Yep. Anyways, yeah. No, no it's it's really cool. I mean, I and I think these things are going to grow because it, especially if it's tax deductible, it, it really is a no-brainer. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail us, but I thought we had some commonality there. No, curious. this, this no. is the pod where that happens. It's okay. Okay. We, we accept you. This is how the therapy works, you know. You just had to get it off your chest. Well, and also, you know, there might be somebody, there might be somebody like listening to the pod who is working on something and looking for funding, and it's it's good to know that there's funding at Brink, at OpenSat, Spiral, HRF. Like, there's at least four places yep. that are writing grants for people working on open source Bitcoin related projects. Yeah, and it's good to know that, like Rodolfo said, some of the specialization that each org has, mm -hmm. such that when Brink gets an application that is interesting to me as a Bitcoiner, yeah. but out of scope in ter terms of our mission, yeah. I know where to point those people in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. And there's a lot of good applications. Like, it's surprising the, the amount of good stuff out there. there. There's a lot more coming. All right. Moving on to vulnerability disclosures. Ledger vulnerabilities with an S. Poor guys don't get a break. Ah, oh boy. So basically, every single file on a Ledger Live has users tracked. So there is the tracking shit that we're going to get into the details a little bit. And it's deep, deep tracking, right? Like every interaction, everything. I, I, I didn't, I can't remember if it was anonymized or not. It's sent to a third party. Great. Uh, even if it's anonymized, it's like Ledger's, I think Trezor Suite also does some tracking. Mm-hmm. So even if it's anonymized, it doesn't matter because like you're leaking your IP and also bugs happen and they could accidentally send your balance up. <laughs> you know, like, well, and like I, there was a, um, I don't think this is the case for Ledger, but there was an issue maybe a year ago, year and a half ago, where some Solana wallet was accidentally logging um, seed phrases. Yep as part of like analytics. And it was the same thing, right? Like they were tracking interactions because they wanted to know what percentage of users like tapped whatever button. And they, they had like a debug statement that was logging the seed phrase. And a lot of people got wrecked because of it. You know, and, and that sort of like gets us to the, to the second ledger 
vulnerability disclosure. Yeah. Which was the which was very poorly disclosed, by the way. Yes. Uh, I think somebody just fucking posted on the internet. They were pulling <laughs> JavaScript libraries from a CDN into a wallet and also not version locking it. Yeah. So that's absolutely brutal. That's when you fire the whole team. It, it, you know, again, right? Like complexity, right? So they have all this tracking code. They have all the shit coins to maintain. And it's thousands of shit coins. You know, like you just, you just, it's impossible for you to keep that stuff clean. Impossible for you to keep it secure. Well, and like the, the JavaScript CDN thing was really interesting because like the component that got pulled in, and I think there were a lot of people that were making jumps maybe further than made sense. But like what, what happened there is in the, uh, I'll call it like EVM compatible ecosystem. So like Ethereum and all of its derivatives. Um, there's this thing where like you go to a web page and there's a button that says connect your wallet and you hit it and you connect like MetaMask or Ledger or whatever. And then, you know, when you want to interact with the application, it sends you a transaction and your wallet pops up some UI that says, do you want to sign this transaction? You hit like yes or no. And it, it like does the operation. So what happened was the little button that says connect your ledger the script that that button was loading was coming out of a CDN. And they weren't, like, there's a thing that you can do when you load JavaScript where you can pass a hash of the script that's supposed to load. And if the script that it fetches doesn't match that hash, then it, it will refuse to load it. They weren't doing that. They weren't locking the version on what they were pulling in. Oh, that version locking. Yeah, like, it, they were just pulling, you know, the latest pointer. And somebody replaced that JavaScript in, uh, I think, in NPM, with a wallet trainer. And so what's really funny is the people who were most exposed to that were probably non-Ledger users. Because like if you're like a MetaMask user, you go to this website and this like Ledger button is pulling in a wallet drainer. And so if, if you're like Bitcoin only on Ledger, it probably didn't affect you directly other than what NBK just said about like the engineering team also has to focus on all this other complexity. But yeah, it was, it was just a classic, just dumb JavaScript vulnerability. With the tracking issue, did Ledger respond to that? Uh, it, like, I'm, I'm trying to steal, man. So, like, with uh, with, with Optic, we have a... No, I don't think there was a response for that one. I think it was just more like, yeah, we track, whatever. Well, of. I guess the assumption then is that those analytics are useful for them to craft their usability in a better way or some such thing. Like, or what shit coins to send, what shit coins to sell you. Yeah. Yeah, the steel man is that you use it in product development to like understand what things your users are having trouble with and what things they're using and like use it to update your roadmap. It's very common. Yeah, it's super common. But I mean, what you would hope is there's a lot of techniques um, like Apple, for example, uses a thing called differential privacy where, you know, it, it's it's not just anonymized because usually when you hear about like anonymized like analytics info they just like randomize your ip or change some fingerprints there's some like more advanced techniques like differential privacy i don't think that's what ledger is doing because everybody who's doing differential privacy writes a blog post about here's how we're doing differential privacy you know rindell that's where i differ i i think that when it comes down to money handling yeah cryptography money right so shit coins and bitcoin there is no place for any of this shit mm. Because again, bugs happen. Everybody causes bugs. It's software, right? Yeah. And and the stakes are just too high. There there is no backseas, right? Yeah. And I mean, like, even outside of this, I think the 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 thing that I didn't see enough people maybe giving Ledger a hard time about is with either of these things, like if this was a bug that happened, like what other practices do they have that allowed this to happen, right? Like if um, like the, the JavaScript wallet connect button, that's just classic software supply chain. Like where else do they have gaps in their software supply chain controls that would have allowed this to happen? I think the, the analytics thing is something similar, right? Like if, if they don't have a response to the fact that they have very instrumented wallet software that all of their users are using, like where else in their stack do they, do they have this, this kind of thing? There's a Dr. Phil quote here huh. that is uh, for, something like for every rat you see, there's there's 10 you don't kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I guess you hope they're not there. I mean, putting on my product manager hat with regards to Optech, we send out, you know, email newsletter every week through MailChimp. And we also have the website. 
and I would love to be collecting analytics on, you know, which pages of the Optech wiki are visited and yeah. which links in the newsletter are clicked. And I actually have to go through a lot of rigmarole every newsletter to unclick the buttons in MailChimp that say mm-hmm. track link click it. And in fact, I have a feature request in for them to allow that to stay unchecked because every single time I send it, I have to unclick those. Um, and that's just, uh, you know, someone receiving a newsletter and clicking a link, right? <laughs> you know, think about it this way, right? So for the people who own firearms, right? Yeah. Can you imagine having analytics inside your safe where you keep your passports, your firearms, your, you know, bars of gold or whatever the heck you keep in there? Like, and oh, no, promise. I promise you this camera that's inside the safe is anonymized. I just want to see how you put the guns inside. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, no, it's an absolute no. Right? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> It's just, listen, you know, maybe, maybe I'm very biased on this because we built the product this way, but like, you know, simplicity when it comes to security and privacy is everything. Yep. Right. Like I forgo sales so that we built it to be simpler so that there is no shit coins. You make a killing with shit coins. Right. But you add, you open yourself for a lot of attack surface, right? The more complexity you have, more attack surface you have. That's why you don't use a general purpose computer for Bitcoin, right? Because, you know, it has a GPU there that was designed for games, yeah. right? You're not gaming with your Bitcoin. It should be simple, yeah. right? You don't use a Raspberry Pi to start your Bitcoin because there's a bunch of stuff in there, right? You know, like the people who are serious in this space, like we're going down to as far as we can, you know, bear like almost like making your own silicon so that like, you know, there is less holes because the holes are there, right? Say, like, how do you mitigate this stuff? It, you know, it's kind of infuriating because it makes everybody else look bad too, right? Like consumers lose trust in, in like these devices, right? Like mm-hmm. it's like one after the other. It's kind of annoying, especially coming from the people who used to spend millions of dollars breaking everybody else's devices. Well, and especially, you know, like ledgers had issues before with like PII leaks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They lost everybody's emails. Right. It would would be very different if if that's never been an issue. And they said, we have a really robust track record of protecting user information. But like, I don't know, this group in particular should probably be extra careful about collecting things that can individually identify users. And a lot of times, even if you anonymize analytics, you can still use it to, to fingerprint users. And you might not have like a direct, you know, personal identifier on, on a fingerprint, but you, you can make it distinguishable. And you start like combining that with other information and you find out what, how much money people have really quickly. I mean, it's not fun. I mean, like you now have a person's address because you sent them the device. Yeah. And then you go and you accidentally get the the amount that's in their house. Like, that's a real fucking problem. Yeah. Right? And, and then, like, you know, Trezor Suite, the same shit, right? They, they are doing analytics, right? Oh, it, it has opt out. But no, like, just don't fucking do it. Like, and because there's all the shit coins there too. There's all this shit that needs to be, like, you know, reviewed. Like, there's only so much code that can be reviewed. It's infuriating. <laughs> it's fucking infuriating. Well, especially because, like, analytics usually that's not an in-house function at most product development places. Like you, you grab, you know, the Datadog SDK or something, right? So like you don't actually own that, that data storage like somebody else does. Oh, they all sign a contract waiving liability to whatever company provides the analytics APIs, right? Like that's how all the shit works. Yeah. It's absolutely brutal. So stop. You know, the best solution for all this is don't use a client, a Bitcoin client, like, the wallet, the computer wallet or phone wallet from the same vendor as your hardware wallet. That's like one of the best things you can do. Separation of church and state there. Because yeah, you lose a little bit of the UX, but now you need two different vendors to to collude or have a, a, a equitable bug, right? In order to expose yourself to some of this stuff. Yeah, I think I think especially as we get into like some of the music, frost, like other w- more interesting like signing mechanisms that I think we all hope are coming. It's going to be interesting to see if we put like more metadata into PSBTs or like what else we do to make better interoperability. So if you want to use, you know, Blue Wallet or Sparrow or something with arbitrary hardware wallets that you can like do all this extra stuff. I think that that's that's like one place where 
it might be harder is like as we get into more exotic scripts and like signing schemes, it's going to be a lot easier for people to build things vertically integrated. And you actually want to break that up a little bit. Yeah, no, there's going to be a lot more uh, uh, synchrony as well, right? Which increases attack surface. One good example of this is like, you know, anti-Klapto, so anti xfio sort of solutions. Like I, I, I refuse to, to do them because there is no standard and you need to make the wallets hot, right? So like, you know, if you're using the proper RFC implementation of deterministic nonsense mm-hmm. for, for signatures, right? Like there, there is no XFIL. Like, I mean, that attack is not possible, right? Because you have deterministic, you can prove that you're using random nonsense, right? The way you, you you do that on top is you have a reproducible build, right? So like mm-hmm. th- there's a certainty, a provable certainty, right? That you're doing the signatures in a way that you cannot exfil, right? While the anti klapto spec is amazing, it's very cool tech, right? Very smart, but there is no standard on that contract. There is, people need to plug their, their wallets in, which is terrible. Mm-hmm. It negates all the other air gap amazing features that you get from that, uh, which are way more <laughs> like realistic attacks <laughs> than an XFU attack. Yeah. And and it, and it, it doesn't even use Bitcoin primitive, like a PSBT V2 to carry the contract back and forth, right? Yeah. It, it, it's just not there, right? So, you know, I, I understand that the wallets that, that are already breaking air gap barrier for them is okay to do it. That That's great. But like, I'm not gonna break the air gap barrier to do this. Plus, can you imagine if there's an issue with your contract and now the the, the nonces are not random anymore? Right. <laughs> it's a huge hole. Yeah, I mean, like the the thing that anti klepto defends against is malicious firmware, right? And like, depends on your threat model. But I think if you're using like a cold card and you've validated the signatures on the firmware and you can like reproducibly build the firmware. Missing out on anti klepto is a better trade off than like plugging your cold card into your PC. Like that's that's like a much better solution. That was the math I did in my head. Like, yeah, it really is that simple, right? Like everything, nothing is without trade offs, right? And, and these are much better trade offs in my view. End of <laughs> end of rent. <laughs> oh, Keystone license change. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna read it out loud, but I'll let people go on the show notes and go read that one. It's pretty funny. There was uh, an added clause on the Keystone license to prevent cloners. I don't want to rat hole into like licenses, but um, I, I used to spend a lot of time working with lawyers on licensing software, and I, I just love it when people write licenses specifically out of spite. Yes. A couple of years ago, AWS did a lot of what I call strip mining open source, where they would take like an open source product, offer a service version of it, and then just like completely destroy the company that was trying to commercialize it. So That's their business model, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 totally. And so like MongoDB pioneered this like model where it's open source, except you can't run it as like a cloud service provider. And like that, that license is now like a fairly common license for for things that you'd want to host in the cloud. It's well, that, that's what we did. It's it's open source, except mm-hmm. for a commercial for you to to try to like clone it and sell it as a company, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, but then you get into open source baiting. It's a free open source. No, right. is it open source? Well, that's debatable, and, and it becomes a mess, right? So, in, in this particular instance, there's there's some. I mean, maybe you guys can give me some of the backstory here, but there's some drama between Keystone and Foundation. Yeah, specifically. So instead of saying that no, instead of saying it can't be used in a commercial product, they're actually naming not only an individual org but also an individual specifically that <laughs> the CEO of foundation <laughs> is on the license as he cannot use it. <laughs> okay. It's pretty hilarious. I mean, you know, th- those guys are leeches, right? I mean, the way, what else are you going to do? Like, and, and people eventually get tired of it. And it's unfortunate that people, people are not good actors in a space. And that's why we can't have nice things. Next, a critical vulnerability has been found in Ellen bank, an external plugin you can optionally use a BTC pay server. Wow. So, yeah, so that was brutal. And uh, some dude lost, I think, for BTC. And uh, BTC pay server said that, you know, they just, it's like, you know, no warranties. And, you know, they don't check the plugins that well or that often. You know, it's totally understandable, right? Like open source project, it's completely unrealistic. But at the same time, it's like, you know, maybe don't have plugins. Don't 
don't encourage people to use plugins would be my preferred way of going about that. And well, don't put for BTC. Absolutely. Yeah, but you know, people people don't know that, right? I, I mean, it's like beautiful, right? Like, so like people get this confidence on the software, right? That is like really good. I, I haven't used BTC Pay server in ages. Like, is there a warning saying like, don't put more money than you're willing to lose in this software or something? That's a good question. I haven't used it for real in a while. That's a really good question. It, it's hard. I mean, like, you know, it, it's like, Building software like that is already thankless as it is. Interfacing with normies trying to use it makes it even harder. So, like, I, I, you know, it's not like a blame thing in any way. I think what they're doing is fantastic. It's just that, like, finding that sweet spot where there is enough warnings might save them a lot of headaches with people possibly losing money in their compromised computers. I mean, putting coins on hot computers is <laughs> it's a fucking nightmare. So, yeah. Next. Oh, right. So th this one is funny. So the FBI raided uh, a bunch of uh, uh, PO, uh, not PO, uh, safe deposit boxes in the U.S. Mm. You know, people are finding out the safe deposit boxes don't have the, the sort of like the, the, the legal defenses as they think it does, right? Yeah. So you should assume that a safe deposit box can be visited at a bank, even if the, even if the legally is okay, they can still say there's a bomb and go and look at it, right? So... Mm -hmm. You know, that's where I wanted to bring up that CDXOR fixes this. You can put your CDXOR plates at the safe deposit box. You can even put a little bit of a honeypot there, you know? Yeah. Put a little bit of fund in, in the in the part A or part B. Uh, and, uh, you know, if somebody looks at it and takes the funds out, you will find out. But don't, don't leave plain cryptographic secrets at safe deposit box. Somebody will take a peek. It's no, no bueno. Yep, it's a constant battle with some of the boomer family members of mine that yes. still think that that is safe. A safe deposit box is safe. I mean, it's in the name. It is. It is in the name. No, because the, the problem is, these guys can go like look at the Silk Road people, right? Everybody that worked in in law enforcement got rich somehow, right? In that yeah in that project, it, you know. All it takes is for one of them to take a peek, and they can put it right back in. Mm -hmm. Nobody will ever know that they looked at it. Mm -hmm. Remember, locks only exist to keep honest people honest. Locks can be picked in fast. <laughs> so, so, you know, keep that in mind. Anyways, yeah, don't. And, you know, and if your boomer family member really, really, really insists on putting secrets in a safe deposit box, at least put it in an encrypted micro SD card or, you know, like, I don't recommend putting a cold card there, like, because, you know, unless it has a passphrase on it, but it's better than, I guess, the seed. Yeah, it's, it's not ideal. So, so Schmidt, uh, what's your plan on how to uh, convince the boomers? Well, <laughs> send them the article. So, yes, send them the article and also just take solace knowing that n no cri cryptographic material by these particular boomers that I'm mentioning is being stored in safe deposit boxes, just traditional fiat things, which. Yep. Uh, can can also be bearer instruments, uh, depending on what they are. But but that at least gets caught in camera, right? Like yeah, you know, like there's a higher chance. Like it, those things were designed for your bars of gold, right? They were designed for your watches and for shit like that. Yeah, because like the the thing that people don't quite wrap their head around sometimes with Bitcoin is that like it doesn't require possession of a Bitcoin seed; it requires knowledge. And so like you you can look at it and write down or memorize 12 words and read and like leave the original artifact where it where it is and like money is still gone right but yeah walking out with a you know negotiable bearer bond or gold bars or something like that's that's possession and like there's there's controls against people walking out with items there's not controls yep. around people memorizing items because that's it's, it's it's a new threat model that we haven't had before and remember right like a lot of this technology came from europe and in Europe, they have a lot better laws and better safe deposit box options. It's not like in North America. They have very fancy, very nice facilities for this kind of shit. And they've had a lot of wars <laughs> go in and out to different places there through time. So it's a very a much older industry. While in North America, you know, it's different. It's a different thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's your like local branch on a plaza. Yeah. You know, that the guys can break from the back, <laughs> you know, or as in Brazil, they do it, they use dynamite. 
<laughs> they just say fuck it. They do that to uh, to ATM machines too. It's just literally fuck it. Just dynamite the thing and get what you can after. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. All right. Uh, Shake Pay customer information leaked. Yay. Yay. Don't keep it. Well, you know, they have no choice, right? I mean, KYC companies must have the information. That's the state's fault. And, you know, a lot of JavaScript devs losing that information after, but still. <laughs> Brutal. It, it's terrifying. The, the physical address. It's terrifying. The physical address stuff. I mean. You know, uh, a couple of Bitcoin exchanges, I dealt with it before. I made a conditional on my engagement contract that like all the KYC is done on paper. Hmm. Paper only. Interesting. You know, I'll fly at my own cost to your office. Yeah. No, you know, it's fine. I understand you have no choice, right? Because that's how the KYC bullshit works. But we're going to do this on paper. Okay. You're going to photocopy my shit. You, you know, you're, you're going to like make me do all the paperwork there. And then you're going to put in your save. Right. That's fine. Okay, it's shit. Yes, it is shit, but at least it's not digital, right? Hmm. And that satisfies the state. It's just that we need more people requiring that from their service providers and more exchanges be willing to sort of like, you know, go to bat for users. Hmm. Many companies do that, if you ask. You might just have to convince somebody, but totally worth it. All right. Uh, last one on that list. A controversial ocean upgrade fixes long-standing vulnerability exploited by modern spammers. They fixed the CVE. <laughs> Love it. As a result, our blocks will now include many more real transactions and help bring an end to DDoS attacks performed by Bitcoin Network. God bless Luke. One of my favorite people in Bitcoin. Yep. I, I, I love what Ocean is doing. Uh, I don't think it's long-term thinking to be doing this kind of bug fixing at this moment. I think this bug will get resolved by economic, via economic pressures. You know, the DGN will run out of money to pay for JPEGs to be transferred. Well, the JPEGs don't really get transferred. The ownership of it claims to be transferred. I, I mean, we, me, Rindell, and Casey, Casey, right? And yep. There was one more person, I think. No, I think that was just the three of us. Did a very good two hours on the topic. Yeah. Many, many, many episodes ago when ordinals were just coming out. Highly recommend go listen to that. All right, uh, Rindell, do you want to give some commentary on this? Well, I mean, the thing that's, there's a couple things that are funny, right? So one of the things that's funny is that the day that they implemented this filter, and I'm not going to say censorship. I'm going to say filtering, right? The day that they implemented this filtering. Which is true. Because that's what it is. The thing that was causing the fee pressure was actually not inscriptions. It was a new shitcoin protocol called Runes, which uses op returns. And most of the op returns actually fit inside the data carrier limit that Knots is using. Mm -hmm. So they, they actually like weren't filtering that. They were filtering inscriptions. You know, most of the inscription pressure is JSON instead of JPEGs. And I think that's just hilarious. And then, yeah, I mean, uh, they can filter whatever they want. Long term, where mining all needs to go is having more people making their own templates. And so if individual miners want to mine with Ocean and they want to mine all of the JSON, then that's fine. I think that's like a rational economic thing to do. Stratum V2. Yeah, it might not be a good strategic move for Ocean to be like, fighting this fight now like if i were them i would be very focused on getting stratum v2 rolled out as soon as possible so they can just wash their hands of it become the filterer when you have all the hash rate right become big first yeah get big first and then charge monopoly rents like that's that's the move and so i think that that's the move yeah listen you know bitcoin is war yeah you know and if you're gonna do war go sun zoo on the other ones right yeah and i i, I feel like them dying on this hill now, like they're too small to be dying on this hill. Like they need to wait till they're bigger. I agree. It's part of the strategy. They they are showing the use case for Stratum V2, and they're 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 batting it. They're batting at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe this. Maybe it is part of the strategy. It could be, but but they're like bleeding hash rate right now. Like they're down more than almost twenty percent of their hash rate. They're down since the thirteenth. So in a week, they've lost. Almost a hundred petahashes per second of hash rate. Um, I don't. I don't know if this is like the right move for them. But like you know. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, it's kind of it's a funny one because like you know, I think what they're doing is great. Yeah, I, I really think we need more miners thinking with this sort of mindset of you know, like 
really decentralizing the template and trying to do these things. I also like knots, contrary to many people. I think knots is great. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the line of last defense. It's the only non-core maintained core. Yeah. You know, th there's a few policies there that I wish weren't there, but that's, you know, that's for the maintainer to sort of maintain. <laughs> but but yes, I, I think like long term, you know, is get the hash first. You know, another thing too that pissed me off is that like, you know, people are okay with Marathon was doing OFACT mm -hmm. like uh, censoring, right? Like, but not this. It's, you know. Oh, I don't think they were, were they? I mean. Yeah, they were at some point. No, they were doing it, but people weren't okay with it. There was a lot of backlash when Marathon did that. Didn't they take it out? They 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 withdrew that. I, I think it, it's not really taken out. It's just that nothing else came up. <laughs> Well, it's, it's interesting also, I don't know if you guys covered this already in a previous show, to the, to see what happened. I think it was F2 Pool. Uh -huh. I think Xerox B10C did some analysis and determined that F2 Pool was filtering out some OFAC-related transactions. And, and I think uh, F2 Pool almost immediately was like, okay, we turned it off. And then you, you see the other side of it, that, you know, the ocean is sort of doubling down and, and not not relenting. So you kind of see both sides of it now i, I you know there, a lot of good things came out of this you know honestly it's like we aired out a lot of things that people don't understand about mining filtering mining censorship templates like nobody knew how mining really works like people think that yeah you know just because you have your hash rate pointed at something you have any power no you know the mining pools are the sole sort of controllers of of how bitcoin is mined using your hash rate I really like this idea on how they described as like a hasher versus a miner, uh, you know, and everybody out there is really a hasher, not a miner. Mm -hmm. You know, a miner decides the template. It's a lot of good that came out of that. I, I, I think they're going to end up probably like changing direction a little bit and, and hopefully, you know, they do well. A couple, a couple of points I'd like to make on this one is that Stratum V2 doesn't solve this per se. It, helps identify that this is happening right so yes that's what people need right well let's say i i'm i'm with uh, i'm with ocean and i'm mm -hmm. mining jpegs um in my block templates they could just discard yeah that yeah but then they immediately lose the hash rate they, yes but now we know yeah. now we know that they're doing it right so strategy 2 helps identify that this is going on but doesn't necessarily guarantee that it won't happen which leads to my next point which is there's a lot of i, I think when i see this on, on bitcoin twitter i see a lot of well just switch pools and i think that that's true to a degree it has been true but when the hash rate is in more regulated jurisdictions and, and organizations, it's actually not so easy to switch. That's right. Yeah. It's not because you can't just switch it in, in the co uh, you know configuration. You need board approval, probably. You need the diligence of the new pool. There's all kinds of shit. Yes, and there's uh, a sock, you know, a lot of these um, yeah. organizations need a pool that is like has certain account SOC 2 compliance, right? So how many pools are SOC 2 compliant? Right you sort of get the situation where these quips on Twitter, just, you know, it's no problem to switch pools. Well, yep. that's becoming harder to do. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like if, if you, if you look at Foundry's webpage, they have a whole list of all the compliance checkbox that they check. And if you're like a regulated, if, if, if you're like a publicly traded miner in the U S like you probably have to mine with a pool that has all of those checkbox. So yes, you can, you can move to whatever pool you want, as long as they have all of those checkboxes. And it turns out there aren't many of them. I, I think the thing that Stratum V2 might also help with is it simplifies the policy setting and discretion for the pool. Because like Ocean has said that they're going to let people mine whatever templates they want as long as the Coinbase is correct. And that's like a much simpler policy for them to set and for people to check them on than what they're doing now where they publish like their knots configuration and people have to go and like audit the template. If they just say, you know, our policy is as long as you get our, you know, huge fan out, payout, Coinbase correct, then you can mine whatever you want. Like that's that's like a very simple policy to pull, but hopefully this is just a, a little bump in the road in their in their launch. And I think there's a lot of 
good that can, could come of what they're trying to do. So yeah, I hope so. Hopefully, look back on this as a little stumble and, and not necessarily a catastrophic strategic error. Yep. You know, people people need to learn. Yep. Takes takes. It's good to try to do things and make mistakes. <clears throat> All right. Next. Speaking of doing things and making mistakes, let's talk about covenants. <laughs> now, co- <laughs> you know what? We might not actually get to the rest of the list on this one. Yeah. So I wanted to bring this up because I I was at a got to a close to flipping the table moment today. So CTV plus Vault UA staff comments. Ah, <sighs> so. Is this this is James's proposal essentially? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, fantastic proposal. I support it. I want it. I'm ready. Mm-hmm. However, we're not even close to consensus. The and and what I mean consensus is it really is like enough people with econ- enough economic power who's even interested in running this code, right? Mm-hmm. But you know we have a lot of uh, a lot of people who are uh, frustrated with core development process, which is fairly understandable. It is horrible. And if you're not part of the club, it's even harder. You know, if you're, if you're not, you know, one of the gray beards or friends with the gray beards, you know, we can talk about how core is decentralized and all that stuff, but, you know, it isn't, right? People get a hoodie. I have a, I have a hoodie on. There you go. <laughs> Mike, Mike, can, Mike can attest to the existence of the hoodie. Well, let, let me let, let me uh, interrupt. Yeah, go for it. Um, and this is something I've been thinking about. There's been an, uh, a series of maturations in the space and mm. uncharitable way of saying some of this would be rifts. I think maybe you could say initially everybody who was a developer was also a miner, was also an evangelist, was also everything at the beginning. Yep. Yeah. And we sort of had uh, this, I guess, the evangelists, I guess I could say, have Mm. specialized in Twitter and evangelizing Bitcoin in certain ways. And that split off from the developers who continue to to develop. And I think that that's okay to have uh, an army of people who are trolling Elizabeth Warren who aren't the developers. That's great, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then similarly, you know, the same folks that were maybe coming up with new soft forks for Bitcoin were also the same ones that were maintaining the software and making sure that it didn't fall over on certain versions of Linux and that it was performant and reviewing pull requests and all that. You know, it seems lately that there's maybe another specialization of labor that's occurred, which is the folks who are, you could say, the, the Bitcoin core developers who some of which maybe work on some of these these innovative software proposals, but a lot of that innovation has specialized elsewhere, right? I mean, you have the the wizards doing certain innovations with the existing protocol, and you have a lot of software proposals coming from non-Bitcoin core developers, right? And so maybe we're going through some of that growth, growing pains related to further specialization of labor with regards to innovation, which could include uh, softworks, while the quote-unquote Bitcoin core team is continuing to focus on making sure that this thing is more performant and that it runs on the latest version of Mac OS and that there's encryption between the nodes and that you can, you know. But uh, I'm going to interrupt there just a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so... I think that the main issue is that the promise of Bitcoin is that it's decentralized, right? Like really distributed. Decentralized is the wrong word for it, but let's call it decentralized. You know, but technically we have a full monopoly on the client, right? Because that's, you know, Satoshi wrote the code and the consensus is the code that is pretty fucking hopeless to have different clients, right? Um, so essentially you have a single group of people right? that I know it, it's not centralized, but kind of is. It, it's, it's not like, it's not clear cut. But you do have a more centralized-ish group of people who sort of kind of decides, you know, what PRs stay open and whatever. And, you know, you could say, you know, Git is not centralized. Bitcoin Core is not centralized. You can go make your own client. But realistically speaking, you know, nobody in their right mind with, you know, real money is going to run any other client or is going to run any version of another client. That's one of the reasons why I like Knots is the only one that's kind of like that, right? So, you know, the criticism that I have to core is that like 
you know, you are centralized. So, you know, accept it, you, you know, and sort of like know that people are going to call you sort of click of people who who get to make the decisions and meet and, you know, whatever. But you're free to do so, too. Bitcoin is voluntary, right? Like, if you don't like it, go to fucking other coin. And, you know, and then the users, it's like, you know, like, listen, you know, if, you, if you're plebe with like, you know, 20 bucks worth of Bitcoin, like, dude, you got no say. Like, you, you can scream as much as you want on Twitter, but like, yeah. you know, the power in Bitcoin comes from having a lot of Bitcoin and being able to dump your coins. Yeah. Like, th this is what an economic node is, is a self-validating economical node, right? That That's the power. It's the power of, like, if the fork goes in a different way, you're dumping and, and you're causing a lot of economic grief on the other fork, right? That That's the true tug of war. I, I, I agree with that. Yes, if there's a contentious fork, it's those who hold the coins who can drive the price of one up by selling the, the other and buying buying the other. T totally agree with that. Yeah, and USF, we've proved that, that, you know, the miners don't control Bitcoin, right? It's just that this goes back to way back, like you were talking about the factions and stuff. In the early days, the, the developer, the miner, and the economic node were the same entity, mm -hmm. right? We're slowly doing more division of labor here in a way. And we're finding that, you know, like the economic node may not be a, a, a dev nor a miner. Might just be a quite an actor out there, right? Like, look at Mr. Sailor, right? Almost 1% of Bitcoin under that corp. That's a lot of economic power. There is a lot of people out there who are more independent, private, whatever people with similar holds, right? And, you know, if you think that, like, your UASF is going to go anywhere without, like, dragging those people with you, <laughs> you're completely deluding yourself. Yeah. But again, the frustration, though, on having, you know, you have the core people sort of, like, being a little bit too overbearing with the don't change anything, which is perfectly reasonable. Mm -hmm. but then. The ossified people say that the core people are changing too much. So, like, this goes deeper on that side. Yeah. And then you have people, like, who recognize market problems, right, for Bitcoin that do need solutions, that do need some changes to Bitcoin, sort of, like, getting very frustrated. Uh, and then you have all the noise, the people who don't fucking code, don't have any fucking coin, and can't fucking understand what the fuck is going on, who are, like, just adding more to, this, to, the, to the rift and to the fight and cre creating a fight really where there wasn't. It's a dance. It's it just everything that I see just points to more ossification as opposed to less. I obviously would take umbrage with the centralization of core. I mean, there's, you know, as you know, hundreds of contributors in a given year. Yeah, absolutely. There's obviously folks who contribute more than others. There's obviously folks whose opinion carries more weight, not only in the developer community, but in the broader community, which I think only makes sense in the... I, I guess maybe you can elaborate on the overbearingness of it because if you're referring, to, for example, to let's say the maintainers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I don't feel comfortable speaking for them in any capacity, but I don't think they've really stated a preference for or against covenants generally or specifically, which in, a, in, a, in an overbearing sense, they, they would obviously have a very strong preference. I don't think that happens on GitHub. Right, because people don't want to express some views on GitHub, because of course it's the key. Nothing good comes out of being public in Bitcoin about your opinions, <laughs> you know, like, just as a general rule of thumb. But you know, but you know, when you go private conversations and things, people people feel a certain way, and then they act or knack based on those frameworks. You know, if you ever contributed any code to Bitcoin Core, you'd notice that. You know, it, it's a it's a game of attrition. It's a game of can, how many rebases can you survive, and and if you can ever catch the attention of somebody to review your code, right? Which is fair. I, I mean, like you know, again, like I am not making a moral argument for or against it. I'm just sort of stating the reality of this network and this project, right? So I feel like if people want to change things, they have to find a lot more patience, because listen. If you lose another UASF on CTV, CTV would never happen again. Like, people are just going to say knack, like say no, just out of spite, and never going to happen again. Yeah, my, my, to something that Schmidt just said about, you know, like, uh, the maintainers certainly haven't really voiced support or opposition to covenants. My 
impression kind of from a distance is that I think the current set of maintainers that we have maintaining the project kind of want to stay out of it. And if, if it were me, and like I'm not speaking for anybody, I'm just like trying to have some empathy. Like I've had to maintain some open source projects. Open source maintainership is a thankless job that somebody has to do, but it's absolutely horrible. And I feel like if it were me, I would want that role to be more gardening and more of like a janitor role and less of a dictating policy. So I, ideally, you know, I think what I what I would want if if I had that job was if there's overwhelming technical and community consensus for a fork, go do a UASF. If we discover that that's active on the network, then there's just sort of like a pro forma like you know, upstreaming of that code into core because core is the reference implementation. But that's different from saying, you know, hey, we're going to push this thing out. So that that that's like how I've read people's... I, I don't think it's just the case that people, you know, are ambivalent about covenants. I Like, it, it really seems like people are being deliberately quiet about it. And I think it's because there's a small number of maintainers and they probably don't want to be putting their finger on the scale, if, if I had to guess. Like, I, I don't actually know. And so I think the problem with this current CTV, like UASF drive, is an out of order, like order of operations issue. Like, I think the thing that you probably need to do is go make sure that there's consensus amongst economic actors in the space and amongst developers in the space. And then you put out a UASF client and say, here's the code that everybody wants to run, as opposed to saying, hey, I'm going to put out this code and now I'm going to go try to convince Michael Saylor why he needs CTV. Not only, I guess I would agree with your assessment that folks don't want to put their finger on the scale, but to my point earlier, Mm. there's not necessarily a maintainer. You know, there's obviously maintainers that have certain areas of responsibility. Sure. Wallet peer-to-peer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. mempool, build system, yeah. etc. And, and obviously those folks are experts mm-hmm. in that specific area of the code base and technology, etc. And they will, vo- they will not just sit back and, and, and let uh, improper, if you will, or non-technically feasible things be discussed about that. Yeah. But there is not necessarily a maintainer for soft forks or for covenants. And so... And there would never be, because that would be literal suicide. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Like, I think, like, one, one good way of looking at this is this, okay? It's like, if we have to sort of attribute how the other side of this trilemma thinks, it's kind of like this. The people who don't code, but have some economic capacity, Right. Like, you know, they find the devs to be like overbearing, annoying and sort of like not doing enough or not doing or or doing too much. Right. Because there's the ossify crowd and there is the I need a new feature crowd. And then like, you know, from the dev side is like, listen, you know, like I want to just focus on my shit here. I I don't want to participate in fights. Can you please not come shit all over GitHub? Mm -hmm. You know, and you know what? Like you're offering opinions. They're really dumb. Like. (laughs) <laughs> you know, like it's technically unsound what you're describing. Yeah. You know, I know you may feel that way, but you know, the code is not what you're describing, right? So so then then becomes a sort of like situation where it's like, you know, the, the other person feels like they're looking down and they're not being heard. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's 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 open source like software. I mean, it's you know, it's a meritocracy when it comes to opinions. And and then there is like sort of like you know like the the newer plebs right like who 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 came like who don't sort of maybe like were around for the origin for the first UA well not the first but the the block wars UASF you know who maybe understand how much like how tankless and how much work was to find consensus and and align the parties and and get everybody on board you know like people had in conferences. <laughs> To get everybody to meet together, they had like secret, like you know, meets and people flying everywhere. Like this, this is not just like oh, like a Twitter poll and like let's just do it, right? Like it took a lot, and we lost a lot of people along that battle. <laughs> like, a lot of people, a lot of core devs don't want anything to do with Bitcoin anymore because of that. So, so anyway, it's like I, I don't have solutions or or like it's more like just sort of like a reflection of the problem that I think is only exacerbate. Like, because remember, right? Like, 
the way Bitcoin works is like, if you can't find consensus, nothing changes. It just keeps on going, right? So the more people push, the more the other party pushes back, right? So, you know, that's just people, how people are. So I, I don't know. I feel like, you know, you're going to, because this is not critical, right? Bitcoin is not going to die without this. It's just a feature you want. You, you, you need to win hearts and minds. Like you have to really get out there, win hearts and minds and have the patience of a fucking elephant. I, I I agree with that, and I think I just think that the winning the hearts of minds has maybe, to my point, historically earlier, was winning. You know, was was the maintainers winning the maintainers, and then the rest of the dominoes fell. Where I think it's a bit maybe inverted now. Where yeah, I think you want to win the hearts and minds of, of course, the community of users but also the community of technical experts with regards to this specific protocol change that's being proposed. And the last domino that's going to fall is going to be the maintainers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it, this division of responsibility has inverted that a bit. And I think there's undue pressure on the maintainers to even have a say in, in mm -hmm. these protocol proposals and i think really they don't want to have a say right i mean like it's understandable because they feel like they have too much power as it is yes yes i agree so i i guess yeah. to throw out a, a a scenario here and maybe we can get to the crux of it i i feel like if there was a soft fork proposal related to covenants that did have community and what is the term that adam back uses technical consensus or developer consensus, I would feel confident that the maintainers would see that as something that they're observing and act accordingly. But I don't think at this point that's been achieved. I think mm -hmm. it seems like CTV is getting there. I think the push last year maybe didn't have the quote unquote developer consensus. But when I'm saying that, I'm not saying maintainer consensus, but yep. the developers who are uh, specialized in protocol, you know, stuff didn't maybe weren't yet bought in. Uh, and, and maybe that's changing. I, I, I don't I don't know. I'm an observer just as, as you all are to that process happening organically. Um, but I do feel like if if those first dominoes fell, then I think the maintainers would hit the button, you know? You know, the, the way, like a good way of maybe looking at it is like, you know, you, you need economic and client consensus, right? So like you need to see that the clients want and economic nodes want and, you know, and the technical people find it to be good enough, right? Because they're always going to disagree, right? <laughs> but But at least like there is enough enough people that feels like, you know what, maybe, yeah, fine, we're just going to go with the solution, right? Because eventually the bag shedding has to end. That goes to to sort of add that, like, you know, TX hash coming in and sort of like, you know, being sort of quite early in that proposal, you know, doesn't help, right? Like, I mean, adding like a whole other proposal with like, even it just pisses the fuck out of everybody off too. It's just it's just too many options, right? It's like the bike shedding will never end. There is fifty ways of skinning this cat, right? They're all gonna have different trade offs. So you know, and and for every new actually co contending sort of possible proposal, like it's gonna add another couple of years, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough, right? Like on the one hand, I I totally understand this idea that, um, you know. Bitcoin consensus changes are so few and far between that if you're going to go through the activation energy to do a soft work, yep. like do it once and kind of get covenants, right? Like I, I totally get that. On the other hand, I keep having flashbacks to that like OSS manual on industrial sabotage. And it's like, if you want to prevent something from moving forward, just like keep bike shedding alternatives. And, um, you know, at some point we, we just have to say there's 10 different ways to do covenants pick the one which has the best trade-offs for what we're trying to accomplish and like let's just move forward like nothing's going to be perfect i think that's fair i do think maybe we're at the bike shedding phase maybe not mm -hmm. for example i was having a conversation with somebody who after this conversation put out their own covenants proposal but in the conversation they said they were thinking about this and i said well mm -hmm. and i'm 
by no means a covenants expert. Nobody is, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, I, that's exactly my point. That's exactly my point, which is, I said, well, what do you think of this map proposal? Yeah. And the, per- the person says, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't get it. And I think that that anecdote yeah. is what I'm getting at with that there's not technical consensus. Not if, if somebody proposing, proposing a new covenants proposal doesn't understand the existing related scripting proposals, how are we supposed to be at a point where mm-hmm. it's clear that there's a winner? And I guess that anecdote maybe encapsulates my personal observations in the space. Yeah, I mean, it's easy for the people who are in one team, right, to feel like, yeah, I mean, look, all my friends like this one, <laughs> right? Like, you know, you feel like you are in consensus. It, it, you know, it, it, it's it's harder when you're like have the people who are not in your team, like supporting your position, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I think CTV is getting closer because I see different camps sort of being into it. And again, I think the TX has sort of like threw a wrench in in sort of like a direction it was going. But maybe it's a good wrench, mm-hmm. you know. Maybe 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 it was needed to fortify the position for CTV, or if it needs to change or whatever. But uh, it does have a little bit of a vibe of a bike shedding starting to happen. But again, you know, if Bitcoin is that 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 line is very very sort of blurred <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, because you know out of nowhere there could be a paper that comes out. Like literally out of nowhere, yeah. That sort of either demolishes or improves it greatly, and it's like, and, and it's and it's something that's ten x different. Yeah, you know, m- m- maybe that's the thing that I was kind of poking at when I said it feels like bike shedding. Like m- m- maybe that's not fair to because Tishmini's point, yeah. You know, there's enough variety, and you know, it's not like people have gone and built the compare and contrast coin pool implementation with both CTV and TX hash. And we've said, you know, Hey, let's, let's compare these things. Right. So maybe, we, maybe we're not there yet. It's maybe it's, it's more the case that there's a lot of alternative proposals that are marginally better than one another. Yes. It's they're like, not, no. And, and it's with different trade-offs too. Yeah. That's the thing, but it, but it's not like something comes this out. Five X better. Fine. Yeah. Right. No. No, it, it, it's like TX hash versus CTV. TX hash is like maybe easier to upgrade depending on how easy or hard you think it is to soft fork in new permissible bitmap values. Like, I don't know. That sounds really hard because doing Bitcoin soft forks is hard. So maybe it's not actually better than CTV. Yeah, no, but it's not like, oh my God, TX hash. Right. Erased 10 of the trade offs and is like, right. you know, it's a lot better, a lot simpler, and a lot safer, right? Like, yeah. If something came out that was like, like, and I mean 10x, 10x safer, 10x better, 10x simpler. Yeah. Absolutely. I would dump CTV in a second. <laughs> I am not married to any proposal. I am married to my bags. <laughs> Whichever is better for my bags. That, that's the thing that I liked so much about the OpVault proposal that James wrote up. Yes. Is that people had come up with vault constructions using more general purpose covenants. And when you have OpVault as a vault specific you know, pair of opcodes, it's significantly better than making a vault out of like CTV or APO. Yep. Like it, it is 10x better to have op vault than it is to build a vault out of CTV. So so that's the thing. For example, I only support CTV if I'm getting vault. If you're getting vault, yeah. Yeah, I am not changing Bitcoin for CTV to just be another primitive that has no sort of specific purpose to my needs. Yeah. Right? Like super selfish sort of way of looking at this because then I know I'm not bamboozling myself. Yeah. Right? Like as I, I have a specific need for this, right? I'm not just wanting a shiny new thing, it, it, you know? So so like I, I that's my personal preference. And, and I feel like a lot of people out there who've been around the block feels the same way. It's like, okay, you know, is there a thing or do we want just another shiny thing? Because, you know, we all know how Taproot is amazing and kind of needed or whatever, right? But like, it's very hard to explain to people that it's going to take five years to get something interesting out of Taproot. Yeah. You know, and, and it came with a, a load of headaches, right? I mean, depending on which side of the JPEG conversation you're in. Sure. But anyways, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, JSON. JSON now. It's JSON. That's right. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe Rindo, I think it's time to have another panel where we talk about the topics of core dynamics and uh, activation dynamics and, you know, sort of like risks and consensus. And, you know, like it's one of those things that you can talk for five hours and still sort of like 
you know, you want to hit that little spot on somebody's head where they finally get mm -hmm. get it kind of thing. It's not simple. Yeah. It would be a lot simpler if we just had, uh, what's his name, John Law, the pseudonymous uh, guy who puts out these crazy proposals to the mailing list every so often. I love it. Yeah. We just need him to come up with this 10x 100%. clearly covenant, and then, and then we'll be done. So let's just wait. We'll just wait for that. We're, we're, we're just going to wait. He's going to put this mailing list post that nobody's going to understand for three or four months, and then people will go, oh, holy shit, like, this is the thing that we need. The day Bitcoin stops being weird, we know Bitcoin got captured. Yeah. It's like, it, because as long as it's weird, we know that still weird shit can happen. See, the, the, the dick butt is actually a canary in the coal mine. You know that Bitcoin hasn't been captured because we have dick butts on the blockchain. Absolutely. It's a valid transaction. The dick butt is the canary in the coal mine. That's quite a quote. Yeah. Yep. You know, I, I just, I maybe the last little note on this is, I just wish people understood that like you can you can you can literally reverse taproot, you can reverse segwit discount, and people can prune it and but they were still gonna put these fucking JPEGs on P2SH. Mm -hmm. And that you're not gonna be able to to trim. Nope. Okay. So just be happy that at least we can identify and not keep it in our nodes. Yep. Uh, because P2SH is gonna be there. Forever. God, you can actually say that some of the P2S8 scripts that people make are dick butts. <laughs> Anyways, all right. To the list, finally. An hour and a half in, and we're getting to the list. An hour and a half in, we're going to get software updates. That's right. All right. Uh, software releases, Bitcoin Core, experimental support for 324 V2 transport protocol added. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I love it. Pruning, adjustments. Did it RPCs, new RPCs, load UTXO set for UTXO snapshot loading. That's great. Updated settings, new functions in lib consensus for script verification, wallet changes, coin selection and transaction building improvements, and some GUI changes. Any specific ones here you guys want to sort of maybe tack on or no? Oh, I was going to say the BIP, the BIP 324, like V2 transport is optional. It's default off, but you should try running it on. I've been running a 324 node for like an out for like a year and it works great. Just turn it on. Yeah, just turn it on. And then there's... Uh, it feels naked if you don't. Yeah. And, and like you can actually, there's a new field in get peer info that you can see like which of your peers are, are V2. And you can also, if you like know one of your peers, you can, you know, DM them on signal or something and like verify the session key, which is pretty fun. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's new RPCs for dealing with UTXO snapshots. If you want to play with Assume UTXO. So if you're interested in that, you can like manually create a snapshot and then load it into another node. It's really useful for like bootstrapping a node. Like I had to bootstrap a node on a new machine and I brought my, my UTXO snapshot over. Yep. Those were the two that I, that I wanted to to highlight as well there's uh you know there's a lot of outside of the software stuff there's a lot of chatter that i see on twitter which is like what are the core devs doing and it's nice <laughs> there's a lot to see that this that this release came out with two ginormous multi-year efforts of which rebase hell occurred in both project owners changed in at least one of them multiple times <laughs> that's when you know it's good yeah multiple years of effort and you know you outlined both of those the v2 transport which is encrypting communication um, optimistic uh, between the nodes and also being able to bootstrap a node using um assume utxo you know hu huge projects that were delayed and then you know finally dragged across the finish line by some very ambitious individuals and, and groups that, that that got it done. And and I think if you look, wow, what are the core developers doing? Well, they're doing exactly what I think us bag hodlers would want. They we're adding encryption to the communication such that the metadata being leaked between nodes on potentially where a transaction originated is now more prohibitive to be done by uh, an observer. And we're... Pretty amazing how long it took. 
<laughs> yeah, and it also like you know it, it it's cool. It like also makes it. Th- there's a really fun attack, which is since uh, all the P2P traffic was plain text, your ISP could selectively drop individual transactions that you were relaying. Yep, which is like really targeted, and and this makes that kind of attack much more expensive. It's not impossible because it's unauthenticated, optimistic encryption. And so, if your ISP or your university or your company is like running Bitcoin nodes, they could still man in the middle of you. But this totally mitigates um, like stateless DPI, which is what most people are actually should be worried about. Yep. So I, I guess uh, I, I'm patting the core developers on the back for these big projects that they were able to get across the finish line. We have a core developer representative. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think it's uh, I think we've done we as the more technical side of folks, of which I am affiliated, but not necessarily one of them, uh, do a bad job of of telling the world what we're doing. Obviously, oh, that, that's helps. all technical people. Technical people can't market. Yeah. Y- yes, and I think we can. Otherwise, they'd be marketing people. That's right. And also Bitcoin Core is worse than Technical is also very academic. So that that's like that's like a double whammy there for uh for communication, right? Well, I mean like to 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 give you an example, like one of the things that's really cool in 324 is they use um like a uh in, uh encoding during the the initial handshake called Alligator Swift that makes even the initial like key exchange indistinguishable from random noise, which means in the future we don't have this yet, but in the future you could do like traffic shaping to make that that byte stream actually look like another protocol, which gets you past like additional ways that your ISP might be filtering or blocking you. To make it look like it's Skype. Yeah, and and like that work took a shitload of work and experimentation, like R and D from some really smart people to build a future, you know, to build a feature that like in the future people won't even know is turned on. But will you know mitigate or make more expensive a whole class of of passive attacks and like that's super important for the long term viability of Bitcoin. But it's not something that you know people are going to go shout from the rooftops because it's plumbing. And and a lot of what Bitcoin Core does is plumbing. You know, these people, some of these guys could be working for Google, making you know fucking like <laughs> billions of dollars a year, mm-hmm. right? Because th- this is like the salaries for people that work on this kind of shit in some of those things is, is quite high. Okay. It's not what you think a dev makes. It, yeah. And no, they, they are like grinding on Bitcoin, taking shit from everybody on Twitter. Right. So th- there is two sides to this conversation. So. And, and not only is there some cool encryption there and, and things that could be added in the future, but it's, I think everybody would think, oh, it's encrypted. So there's going to be overhead. And actually, the interesting thing is, the way that it was done is that it's actually smaller communication because there were some uh, little shortcuts that were that were taken, or op- mm-hmm. I guess you could say optimizations that were done in the V2 transport, such that if this is encrypted and it's actually using less traffic, mm-hmm. so it's pretty. I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah, no, it, it is. The people we have available to Bitcoin is uh, it's quite it's quite impressive. It really is. All right. Any other? Or notes? I would add something uh, a bit meta that uh, sure. I don't remember who put out this analysis. I think I saw it on Twitter. Maybe it was B10C again, kind of showing that most, well, I guess a larger than you would expect number of nodes on the network are not running not only the latest versions, but like the latest two versions. Mm. And so I would encourage listeners that there are performance improvements, feature improvements, and bug fixes in these later uh, releases that you probably want, even if you're an ossification person. Um, and I would encourage people to, even if you're not running the, the latest, latest, to at least run you know one version behind with the, the point releases. So You know, what I recommend people is always have all the versions that you ever had running, running. It's great. Yeah. Like, just just don't delete them. Just keep them running. It's uh, it's quite a, a feat of engineering that previous versions still run in consensus. That's kind of the whole point of Bitcoin. All right. Cold card, Mark IV, version 5.2.1. That's us. So temporary seeding port from cold card encrypted backups. That was uh, a much needed one. Export seed words in seed QR format. So that really, so you can import to other wallets from the screen. Hmm. I don't recommend people etching seed QRs into metal. I've said that many times. I don't think people should have unencrypted secrets around, especially in computer viewable form, uh, because cameras love that. 
computer viewable with like checksum and error correcting information on it. Oh, yeah, compressed. Yeah. Uh, so it's very legible from far. Yeah. If you can write, if you can etch a QR by hand, trust me, a computer can see from very far away. And everything you own has cameras now. Anyways, new feature. Uh, provide user with information about transaction level time locks, RTLs, uh, in lock time and, and sequence when signing. This is really cool. I wanted, like, we needed a, a way for, you know, we believe in people signing what they know. So they, they have to check. And so we figured, hey, why not adding the the time locks on the screen of the signer so that you know that you're signing something for 100 years instead of 100 blocks accidentally or something. Mm. So, so it's all there. It's all on the screen and it's quite That's cool. Quite legible, actually. New menu for saved uh, BIP39 passphrases, allow delete of saved entries. Like there's a bunch of like sort of improvements on the seed, uh, seed vault stuff. There is a new passphrase, uh, like now when you change from one from one secret to another or a combination of secrets, right? Like a BIP39 plus passphrase or whatever, it shows you the 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 previous XFP to the new XFP oh, that's cool. kind of thing. So you know what you're switching from what to what and not getting sort of like accidental yeah. fun sent to something. So yeah, that, that had to be improved. Uh, 12, oh yeah, so we move into 12 words as the default. We decided to stop trying to fight with the noobs, just let them have what they want. Oh no, you capitulated. Yeah. You know, the second option is still 24. You know, if you if you if you are a person who works with cryptography, you are gonna appreciate the 24. You understand the range problem, and you believe in having a the biggest seed that you can. What else? I am a 24 enjoyer. <laughs> Allow passphrase via USB. Oh, so there's some new HSM functions. We improved some some UX. Uh, there were some uh, improvements on how the SC1 talks, and it's like lots of little things like that. And this is th- this is all out in production. Your production firmware. This is not. You guys have like an ed- what is it called Edge or the experimental version? Yeah. So this now this is this is production. This is safe. Yep. Stable. Got it. And Edge, Edge is gonna get these changes rebased to it, like you know, this week or next week kind of thing. So Edge has Taproot, has Schnorr in it, and it has Miniscript. We are still not comfortable with that stuff on stable. We don't. We, we find that the client software is still very rough around the edges. There's just too many foot guns in Miniscript still. So you know, we want to see how that plays out. But yeah, this is on stable as live as of yesterday. All right, Frost Snap prototypes first look. That was really cool. Super exciting. It's like a USB Frost based wallet, hardware wallet that you attach, you daisy chain them, uh, and they they do the 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 non sex change dance, and then you have yourself a Frost wallet. Find it cool. They're doing uh, it's serial, just leveraging the USB port. It's not serial over USB. It's just serial. <laughs> it's like the, the weird things you can do with the poor engineering of ESP32, which is kind of really cool. Yeah. And like Nick Farrow, the guy behind the project, he wrote the Frost implementation for libsecp 256 k fun, which is Lloyd's yes. libsecp implementation in Rust. And so he's building a hardware wallet and like this, he, he has a prototype out. Uh, I, I call it a USB centipede. It's like a bunch of things like connected into each other serially and they use it to do all of the um distributed key generation and then all of like the actual signing and uh it looks looks really cool yep it's the first hardware wallet that i've seen that does frost and it's it's very prototypey like when you see the picture it's a bunch of esp32 like dev boards connected to each other what i really love is that people try new things Mm -hmm. they're not just sort of like oh look i created a new hardware wallet it's the same as everything else but in red yeah you know what I mean? It's like, it's like different stuff. This guy's, this, I don't know, I, I, I found it to be super cool. And I think we're going to add that serial interface to uh, Setslink so that you can connect them in Daisy Chain. That'd be cool. As well. I feel like I'm excited by a lot of this Frost work. Do you guys feel like it's yes, yes. overhyped or underhyped at the moment? It's just hyped. Yeah. Perfect hype. I think I think it's it's the perfect amount of hype. I think the thing that people have paid a lot of attention to, especially now, 
is the on-chain footprint. So being able to do a threshold signature with a single uh, Schnorr signature on-chain is really good in the environment that we're in. The the feature that I think is maybe a little bit underhyped that I'm really stoked about is there's a thing that you can do called proactive secret sharing where you could replace or add or remove a signer without an on-chain transaction. So, you know, this is really helpful for a wallet where if you've been like DCAing Bitcoin every month into your wallet and then you want to change the size of your quorum, not having to sweep all of your UTXOs in order to do that is a killer feature. Yep. Uh, Roast is great. Yeah. You know, I I am a, a multisig hater. I feel like uh, P2SH and it, it, it's just it's just it's just wrong. Like everything about multisig is wrong, mm. wrong way of doing it, extremely inefficient. It's like a million ways to screw it. Like it's just, it's just wrong. Yeah. So I think it's frost. So essentially like you have a single signature really as Bitcoin is concerned is, is a, you know, it's, it's like sane and, and you can do interesting things with it. Yeah. I mean, like we, we have threshold cryptography, the fact that we're using scripts to implement a threshold scheme when we can do actual threshold cryptography doesn't make any sense. Well, that's why everything breaks, right? I mean, ECDSA was not meant to be multi-party computation. Uh-huh. Right? Like, there's like a lot of problems that come from us trying to <laughs> use a nail, sorry, using a, a hammer on a screw, right? Like, And uh, yeah, we, we did a very good episode about Frost. It's worth going to go listen to it. I think we, we've we've attacked a lot of interesting parts of it. I can't remember which show number it is, but you can always search the notes. Uh, sorry, search the the site. Yeah, so so that's sort of like where we're at with that. I, it's very early, it's very 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 early. So uh, don't don't get your hopes up as a user. What, what do you think, Mike? I think it's as a optech observer and a Bitcoiner. I, I think that stuff is the frost stuff is underhyped. Uh, I'm excited about it. We at Brink funded Jesse Posner, who was doing some of the Frost research stuff, and he went off to industry to, to actually implement some of this work. And I, it's interesting to see some of the stuff that like UTXO Club and the FrostNet people are, are working on. It seems some of it, like the rolling the keys without any on-chain footprint seems borderline magical to me now based on what the historical is. Yep. Yeah, I'm excited to see what's coming in a more mature version. You know, I can't remember which exchange was. I don't know if it was Bitfinex, but it was one of the big ones that uh, they were able to dox which founders had which keys for their multisig. Really? Because, you know, they just observed enough. Yeah, there was something like that. I can't, you know, it's one of those that happened long ago and I never saved the, <laughs> the links. Just too many stories happen in Bitcoin. But uh, if, you, if you're good at Googling, go find it. Uh, it was an interesting story. Well, and like related to overhyped, underhyped, um, I just saw a tweet over the weekend. I forgot who it was, but somebody had put together the first output descriptor that had like Musig as a function name, like in a in a taproot descriptor. Those kinds of things are going to be the long tail for adding like Frost and Musig support. It's like it's not going to be the cryptography. It's like getting it into mini script and output descriptors and getting wallet support and figuring out you know, making sure that everybody does nonces correctly because you can't do deterministic nonces. Like all of the blocking and tackling stuff, I think is going to take a, a while for it to actually get implemented in wallets. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it's this stuff is pretty foreign. Yeah. It, it, and it's new cryptographic primitives too. There, there's a lot of ground to be covered before this goes anywhere. So just, you know, patience. I guess that's the thing we say about everything new in Bitcoin. It's so cool. You're going to use it in five years. Yeah. <laughs> I can't just imagine how frustrated on testnet. You don't test. You're going to use it on Signet in five years. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's a Bitcoin Bitcoiner equivalent of I think it's Parkinson's laws, which is uh, it always t- <laughs> it always takes longer than you think to complete a project, even when you take into account Parkinson's law. There's like something like that for Bitcoin as well. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, it always takes longer to to get broad adoption, even when taking into account that it takes longer to get broader adoption. So the line is uh, technology is always going to take longer than you think. No, it's going to take uh, less than you think and longer than you want <laughs> to be to be in, in play. Something like that. There's a there's a short version of that. 
All right. Uh, BTC Pay Server, new features, web hooks, uh, support for 129 multi sig port, POS keypad, and a bunch of other things. I'm going to start rushing through things because, you know, otherwise we're never going to make it. Yeah. Liana version 4.0. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> okay, that's funny. Lots of updates. Keeper version. Fee bumping is the big one. Go ahead. They have fee bumping now. That's like their big. Oh, update. yeah. Fee bumping. I mean, th- you cannot use a wallet anymore that doesn't have fee bumping. The conversation about 4BF, I think, is over. Yes. Uh, I No sane person would put a transaction in the blockchain right now without RBF flag on. Like, that would be insane. Uh, unless they're really good at scripting and they want to wait a little bit and try to redo it, right? Like, not fun to have to wait for a transaction to drop from the mempool. Keeper version 1.1.8, custom multi-sig and a few other things. Rust pay join version 0.12.0. That's pretty interesting project. I don't know if you cover it here, but uh, there's a pay join CLI. Yep. Oh, cool. That is built on Rust pay join that is meant for use in Bitcoin Core. So it's like a nice a way to do pay join within Bitcoin Core. We covered that um, last week. Oh, that's awesome. Dan Gould has really been on a tear with this pay join stuff, which is great to see. Yeah, he's really pushing this. And we need it because all the other coin joins are shit. <laughs> Oh boy. Yeah. You know, it's okay. We're an hour and a half in. Nobody's listening anymore. You can say whatever you want. I don't know. Samurai is going get, to get after you. That's okay. I'm part of the clique. I'm protected. Anyways, mempool.space, mempool goggles. That's a very cool way of like looking at details of transactions and things. It's very cool. Those guys are killing. Good job, Wiz and crew. Uh, Nerdminer version 1.6.3. <laughs> new Shalib 78 kilo hash. It is a fun little project. You, you can now dot your pool faster. That's right. Agora Dask version 1.1.15. Are these people the same people who made the dark market Agora? I don't think so. Just, you know, they brought over the name. And Wait, actually, it might be. Just kidding. Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, the GitHub org is Agora Desk slash local Monero. I think it might be the same. Okay, so there you go. It's probably the same folks. Great. Good on them. Yeah. Blockstream Green Android version 4.0.20 iOS and desktop all updated. So now they support BP85. Still don't support PSBT. Yay. Samurai Dojo Samurai. No. Uh, Samurai Dojo updated a bunch of stuff. OX still still closed source. Ronin Dojo removed BISC support because they probably said something they don't like. <laughs> what did you say? What, what's still closed source? OXT. OXT. Oh, okay. That uh, that chain analysis uh, website. Yeah, their chain analysis service. It's all closed source. Nobody can know what they do or what they send the information to. It, it, it's a cool. It's a cool site. It's a cool service, but yeah, it's great. It really works well. Like, I mean, props to them for that. But it's closed source for the because you know they're they're fast maximalists except for OXT. Roni UI version 2.4.0, display better information on Electrum server. Oh, also, the other thing, just tying back to the earlier topic, uh, Samurai Dojo now actively refuses RPC connections to nonce. Yeah, right. I mean, it's it's all because there's some drama there with uh with Whirlpool. You know, they they really think Luke made that change, thinking of Samurai. Like yeah. people are not thinking about Samurai, dude. Like <laughs> ah. It's like they're always looking for a drama to pick on with somebody, right? What are you going to do? <sighs> Economics fixes everything. It really does. Project Spotlight, the Hash Hub, uh, mobile Bitcoin mining heated hot tub. I support this project. That I, I need one of those. What about uh, Sauna? Sauna. Yeah, Sauna. That's what I was thinking of. Sauna Miner. Although, like, I'm not sure if I want that kind of, like, wind moving. Like, it's it's going to blow out all the humidity. It'll be a problem. Yeah. It's going to probably be, like, it's like a convection oven. You know, you, you, you'd you be burning there. Yeah, and you won't get the, what, what do they call it in the sauna world? The lolly? You won't you won't be getting the lolly? Yeah. But, <clears throat> but you know what? You could, you could do a heat exchange between the miners mm-hmm. and a nice, fat copper pipe into the sauna. And then, and then you get a lot of preheat. All those saunas are so efficient nowadays. I have a five kilowatt and a six kilowatt, and both of them, like, you know, it doesn't really, you know, it's not that much power. 
Why do you have two saunas? The different locations. Ah. I, I sauna every day, man. Like I, you know, some people need to have whatever golf clubs. I need to have sauna. <laughs> so coin select TypeScript library for Bitcoin TX management by Bitcoin LAB lab. No, Bitcoiner lab. All right, uh, Lightning plus L2 plus L3. A software releases LND version 0.17.3, LN Bits version 0.11.3, Zeus version 0.8.0. Very nice looking new Zeus, by the way. Phoenix, Android uh, version 2.1.0. Also, great looking app. It's doing like, you know, it's, it's, it works very well. Just expensive because it's self custody. LDK node version 0.2.0. Guys, feel free to jump in. I'm just going to keep on going. Yeah, I'm like scrolling through highlights, seeing if there's anything I want to. Okay. Lightning terminal version 0.12.2 alpha. Mutiny wallet announced Mutiny wallet for Start OS. That's great. You can run your own stuff there. They also now have one step um, like Noster Web Connect, yes. which is pretty cool. What is Noster Web Connect for the Noster novice? It's Noster, sorry, it's Noster Wallet Auth. So it's like um, you want to be able to like click a button on Noster. Like I want to zap a post that MVK made. And what will happen is my Noster client will publish a message that says, Reindahl wants to make this payment to MVK. And it's signed with my Noster key, right? And so, it, you know, my, my, what then ends up, ends up happening is my lightning wallet sees that that message that note and makes a lightning payment and so i have to like register my um nostr pub key with my lightning wallet and then my lightning wallet will listen to a nostr relay and when it sees specially formatted messages that are authorized by me it'll make payments on my behalf okay cool so it's a usability improvement so you don't have to like confirm that it's kind of like you know technically very different but spiritually is very similar to Lightning Connect mm -hmm. to like how you control a node or is just in using the Lightning Network as as the, the as the transport. It's kind of like that. And, and it lets you like decouple your Lightning wallet from your Nostra client because what you don't yep. want to do is you don't want to have to say, I'm going to build a Lightning wallet into my Nostra client, fund it, and then be making like payments out of it. And you might want to have your Nostra client be like on your phone but then have your lightning node be something that can be interactive and online all the time because like offline receive is really hard on lightning and you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can decouple like where the lightning bits happen from where the Nostra bits happen. Yep. Lost the list here. Breeze SDK core version 0 0.2.12. Taproot assets, tap assets, tap ass. Tap ass. Version 0 0.3.2. 10, 10, 1. Few updates here. A whole lot of stuff. Yeah. For for ten ten one, uh, am I right in understanding that this is a way that I can be using Bitcoin but have ex exposure to to dollars instead? For for this feature, yeah. So ten ten one is like non custodial. So you started as non custodial perpetual swap trading with Lightning. So you could trade like leverage long or leverage short on the price of Bitcoin in Bitcoin over Lightning. So like if you want to like go short on Bitcoin, you can do that and it's all denominated and settled in Bitcoin. And then they added this like synthetic USD thing where under the hood, it's like a contract for difference where you're, you're basically doing a short position on Bitcoin. So if you say I have $300 worth of Bitcoin in my wallet and I want a hundred of it to be like pegged to the dollar and the other 200 to just be like normal Bitcoin, then, then you have this like swap contract with them. And if the price of Bitcoin goes up, you get fewer sats. If the price of Bitcoin goes down, you get back more sats. But you kind of always get $100 worth of sats. And they've integrated it where if I have a dollar of this like synthetic Bitcoin and I want to send it to you, then it basically closes the contract, does a lightning transaction, and then on your side, it like opens the contract. So the experience is that I send a dollar over lightning, but really it's it's just opening and closing these like perpetual futures contracts on both sides. 
that's, I mean, I'm sure there's a million things that can go wrong with that, but I, I do find it appealing to have a. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's more than a million. This is this is like Toro DJ. There's at least two million things that can go wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, uh, where is it? Like, wh- what are the Greeks again for this kind of trading? So this is like Alpha, Beta, Gamma, yeah. Delta. Is, is this is more like a Delta level trade where it's like it's like money and money and money gone. Well, and so so and with ten ten one specifically, there's some extra stuff. So it's using DLCs, like discrete log contracts under the hood. And so, you know, you have like with DLCs, you have uh, like Oracle risk, like what if the price feed is incorrect? With 10.10.1 specifically in their current implementation, they're the Oracle and they're your trading counterparty for everything. And they're your LSP. So, you know, they they could totally rug you, but you know, they're, they're working on it and like they've been doing interesting DLC stuff for a while. They used to have another project called itchy sats, which was like non-custodial trading using DLCs. That was all on chain. And so 10, 10, one is they took all of that and they're trying to do it over lightning now. And so now you have like DLC complexity, tr- you know, derivatives, trading complexity and lightning complexity. So it's a lot of complexity, but they're doing a really good job with it. It's it, it's a cool project to follow. I would never put like a lot of money in it, but it's fun to play with and fun to follow. I, I, yeah, I'm spiritually, spiritually, I, I, li- I like this because it's a way to yes. be in the Bitcoin ecosystem and then have some dollars. Like, so this is like the tether, tether replacement, essentially. Yes. But yes, there's like a million asterisks uh, as they as they go through trying to make this more robust. But but like they're building it. It didn't require a soft fork. And like th- they're just building it. Yeah. Right. And, and like that's that's why I like to see like people are trying new and weird shit. And they're not asking permission. They're just going to go build it. And um, it's a cool, it's a great team. They're very responsive to feedback. Like, um, it's, a, it's a great project. Very cool. All right. Uh, ride the Lightning version 0.15.0. Stacker News. Uh, you can now create your own territories. I'm not sure what that is. Albi. Albi plus Liquid. So now you can, I guess, post Liquid on Albi. <laughs> People want them stable coins. A bit banana. Ellen, you're all off support. Thunderhub. Thunderhub. Version 0.13.25. No idea what this is. Means hopefully you guys do. I love the the Johnny the Johnny notes. It, it, it's like a build thing. Like Nix is like deterministic builds. And so you can okay. probably do deterministic builds of Thunderhub, which is good. Like you want determinism on your like Everything. lightning node. Yes. Yeah. Riverlink launched uh, text Bitcoin to anyone anywhere. Oh yeah, the, I tried the the River thing. It actually works great. Oh cool. You know, there's nothing like Custodial Lightning. <laughs> yeah, works great. <laughs> it works great. It's fast. Uh, but you know, free. yeah, it, it came fast to my to my Phoenix though. Like that that was that's awesome. Fantastic. I'm I'm curious. I, I haven't tried this, and I I have a note to look into this more. But I have an actual use case of family members wanting to send Sats. To my children. That's exactly what they use. It's a very noble thing, but I'm looking at what's happening in the, 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 you know, it used to be they could just send some, some Bitcoins on chain. And now I'm like, well, guys, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I'm like, well, what should I tell them to do? I'm supposed to be the Bitcoin expert of the family. How do I get sats to my, my kids' right. uh, wallet? It sounds like maybe this is, this is one way to do it. Yeah, so like I think what people are discovering is that uh, Bitcoin is not for everyone; is available to everyone. Uh, I'm surprised it took that long, you know. And and Lightning, you know, by uh, association with Bitcoin is going to have troubles too, right? So yeah, like I mean, you know, either send low fee and wait, but, and you know, honestly, like you know, of course, there's something going on now. Whatever, it's the current issue of new project degen thing that's clogging the the arteries. But but reality is like in the long run. You know, sending on-chain BTC for a low amount is stupid, right? I mean, Bitcoin was not designed to buy lattes. Yeah. It was designed to buy pounds of Coke on dark markets, right? <laughs> Coca-Cola. And, uh, yeah. So, cashews. You need the cashews. Yeah, layer three. The, 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 if, you want to, if you want to send Bitcoin to your kids, use layer three. That's right. The, but, yeah, the Riverlink works. It's just custodial. That's all. All right, talk about Cashew. Cashew protocol version 1.0 specs. Okay, so there's like a 1.0. That's great. I'm not going to get into it. It's a whole other dive. Enuts, great app. Version 0.2.0 makes cashewing 
and nutting a lot easier. <laughs> Great UX for nutting. That's right. Great UX for nutting. Uh, mini bits version 0.1.5 beta.18. Okay, so Rindell is gonna is gonna jump off. Uh, sorry, Rindell, I just saw the message. Thank you, thank you for being here, sir. Yep, it was great. I'll see you guys later. As far as you could, take care. Yeah, nobody's still awake. See ya. Ciao. Um, all right. Am I allowed to just leave too? <laughs> just leave whenever we want. No, Rindell. <laughs> Rindell had to. To be fair to him, he uh, he he said that today that was the only slot that he had, and we had to do it today anyway. So we only had him for for two hours. I, I kid. I'll, I'll I'll bear with it. Oh, I know. All right, Project Spotlight. Plebe Dev Curse Cars Course 2, building a Lightning Wallet back in. Shock Wallet Arc Development Developer Hub. Okay. They're moving. Elements Academy. Other cool things. All right. Noster. Any any Mike, any uh uh lightning things I could have forgotten that you want to mention or um do we plow through? Nothing in particular um, in terms of individual pieces of software. I think if folks are curious about, you guys probably already talked about replacement cycling stuff, but we had TBAST on, we've had Lisa on recently to talk about some lightning developments. Uh, and we've also talked about liquidity ads recently with TBAST. So if you're curious about that, not only check out the newsletter, but we've also had them on the podcast to, to talk about some of that. Great. Uh, high level conceptual stuff. And I'll also plug that we put out the year in review Optech newsletter, which recaps a lot of the, the high level Lightning Node implementation, big versions, as well as discussion points around uh, some of the protocol uh, enhancements that have gone on over the years. So check out that. Very cool. All right. So Noster, <laughs> NDK version 2.3.0. Pablo is smashing this. It's getting a lot better. They now have new 42 support via off policies. That's great. A bunch of bug fixes and and other cool little things. Unleash.chat. That's me. Uh, the version is a hash because we still don't have versions. But uh, we now have partially vectorized kind zero metadata so that the LLMs can understand. So you can start sort of like Asking, say, uh, NVK notes as opposed to NPub notes. What what is this? Uh, I d I don't know this project. Okay, so I was kind of tired of dealing with OpenAI. I don't trust them. I don't want them with my data, and they are fully censored and shit. So I created a, another sort of project that we are running open source LLM models. And we're teaching the things we're interested in, and we're making it easy for you to upload the data yourself, and also sort of like bridging it to Nostra Notes uh, for now. There will be more stuff. Oh, cool. Very cool. Yeah. So it's unleashed.chat. Uh, and we charge sats. So it's sats per tokens. So the way AIs work is like you essentially have like, how am I going to explain tokens? But it, let's just say per second, right? So like per per call and request kind of thing that you make to the GPU cards, we charge you for that. It's very cheap and you avoid spam. And we also uh, let you pay to vectorize your data so the AI can understand your stuff because AIs don't understand English. They understand vector maps. And uh, and you can store some data there too. And there's privacy and, you know, it's a Bitcoin or company kind of thing. Yeah, I think right now with the, the AI stuff, you know, GPT, does some cool things, right? But yeah. as we as things progress, it's going to be harder and harder to trust software that isn't open source to not fuck with you. Be skewed. Uh and so I, I think, you know, as this new novelty of AI wears off, it's going to shift to, well, yeah, that that's cool, but can I trust it? And and hopefully more open source alternatives continue to improve there is a lot of them the, the open source stuff is going to actually be better than the private stuff it's the if you look at like the trend lines of improvements on the open source models versus the closed models it, it's like it's it's going to overtake it soon I, i'd say like we're probably six months to a year away of uh, open source models being substantially better than the private models wow that's encouraging yeah no it it, it really is like and and you know the, the whole skynet fear like you know we're so far from that. Like, 
AIs need so much like human intervention on like how the prompts work and, you know, like uh, a lot of alternative sort of like uh, programming and, and like, you know, making it understand how to read things. It's, it's just so human intervention in, in these things to look like they're magic. They're unconcerned. Uh, and yeah, and now we're going to load all the notes from Noster. So, and it's going to be live hopefully tomorrow or the day after, well, maybe next week if you find any bugs, but essentially like, you can query all the nodes through the prompt of, of unleash.chat AI. Uh, it's really cool. So you, you didn't have enough to work on. So you, now you're doing yeah. Noster AI work. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like not invented here syndrome, right? We gotta, gotta go build it, <laughs> but it's working. There's like 400 users now. It's kind of cool. And, uh, and, and, and we're, we're improving it. There's like three models to choose from. The last one is mixed raw, the 8 billion. Uh, sorry, the 8K 7 billion uncensored version. We're going to load any model that's good that that's open. We're going to load it in and you can use it. So you don't have to sort of essentially like trust our models. It's kind of cool. Very cool. And you can upload files now. So you can upload your, I don't know, like a general ledger kind of thing. Well, soon. Uh, no, normalized data is coming in probably like a few more weeks. So right now it's text or PDFs and mostly for the text in the PDF. Uh, so like CSVs and Excel and shit like that, it's probably a few more weeks. Uh, and then you can upload your GL and go do some data analysis on your taxes and shit. And I'm pretty, pretty excited. I, I think we can, we can fix Noster search using LLMs. It's not an easy problem, but it's a good one. All right. Uh, Primo, Android and iOS released. They're really good, actually. Uh, the apps got a lot better. They have a fantastic zap button right in the middle. It's like the, it's a boat icon to represent the wallet. They made it super, super easy for people to join Noster and start using Lightning. <laughs> like, it, it's like immediate, it's, it's custodial, but like it just works. So we can get more people into Lightning and then hopefully they move to non-custodial. What's your day-to-day Noster client? I use Primo and Damos. Okay. On the web, I, I use Primo. On the phone, I use Primo and Damos. Yeah, I have uh, iOS. I have I have Damas, and I've used a, a web version for for something. I think it's Iris or something like that. I hope that's a safe one to use. But you know, check out check out Primo. Okay, and check out uh, Snort. Cool. So Amethyst, if for people who have Android, it's a fantastic one version zero point eight two point two. Lots of updates. Snort, like I was mentioning, Coracle. Fantastic. Nos.social, they all had updates. Uh, Yana had a new update as well. Nos3 updated. CivKit version 2 launched. This CivKit, that is um, the thing that Antoine Riard and I forget who the, who, who's the other contributor to that? Ray. Ray, yeah. Yeah, so the guys who used to work on Paxful sort of built this. It's like a decentralized uh, Paxful, essentially, using Noster and Lightning. I haven't played with it, but it seems very cool. Plebeian market, that's like a whole market on Noster. It's very cool. Noster is going to make great decentralized markets. Mostro, <laughs> NIP33 events, and a bunch of other things. Noster web host, also updated. Noster universe, also updated. OX chat, also updated. Project Spotlight, uh, Noster Tech Weekly. So Noster, the Noster reports, Noster Tech Weekly is a weekly newsletter covering the interesting stuff. So it's a uh, optech for Noster. Yeah, yeah, we gotta get more. There's too many Bitcoiners with Noster der, Noster derangement syndrome. We gotta get them in. I really wanted the mailing list to move to Noster, you know, because it's it's gonna end right on on that on that location. I don't know who's gonna host it. Do we know where it's gonna go? I don't think there's a decision yet, but I do think the leading candidates are groups.io and Google groups at the moment. Oh, God. Yeah. But it's better than email. No, I no, I see. I like email. Google groups is, is a good mess. But if you, look, uh, if you look at where the discussions are happening recently, a lot of it's on the Delving Bitcoin yeah, I know. Web, web forum, which I think is an interesting way of interacting it's a little bit different i think well it's mostly because yeah i know i i really don't like it it's very centralized oh. you know it's extremely centralized right like anyone can get kicked out 
email, you can't kick people out. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I actually never created an account on Delvin Bitcoin. I'm going to do one now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell them to to immediately ban you. Censor me? Yeah. There you go. Censor me. Censor me. Censor me, daddy. What else? Uh, let's see here. What else? It's coming. Where is I lost the list? There you go. No. There you go. All right. So privacy software, software releases. So simple X chat version 5.4.0. It's getting a lot better. A great alternative to Signal and it has proper privacy. It's, it's quite the, it's quite the project. All right. Boosts. <clears throat> uh, thanks everyone. Okay. So top booster, Vague. Three, the Bitcoin is boring and nothing happening show. Guest staring Ben the Caraman. QX OTK. Give me the weirds. And when I wake up and I want to put some sets in there. The next one is, oh, thanks for your show notes, Johnny. The next one is, by the way, great show, useful, great guest, generous. Thank you. Do Bravco, I just got then my chosen handle on uh, Satoshi a couple of months ago. Dang, <laughs> it still works. At the beginning, when, when did you release the Sats card? I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to go dig for that one. Uh, Concealionaire only fell asleep twice. <laughs> Johnny, <laughs> yeah, I mean, people, people fall asleep at the show. Uh, Johnny wants to give a shout out to Alex, who has done a great job editing the pod recently. Thanks, Alex, for fixing my boring and poor grammar um, existence. Where do you guys put the show out uh, in terms of like podcasting 2.0 stuff? We we put the stuff on on Anchor and then which is now pod which is now whatever the thing it is Spotify yeah. yeah and then and then it gets pushed to Fountain. Okay, cool. Yeah, we have the same yeah setup. People were encouraging us to put the Optech podcast on. Yeah, Fountain is nice because people do uh, clips all the time. Like none of the traditional systems do people do clips. All right, Bitcoin up tech. I think uh, I think we're running out of time, <laughs> and we have the guy today, <laughs> the guy. Oh, not the guy. Well, we did cover core. Anything here you wanna you wanna mention? I think the cluster mempool stuff is interesting. There are some very smart people working on this idea, and it's getting more exposure outwardly. So. I, I would encourage people. There's a topic on the Optech Wiki about cluster mempool, and there's some discussions recently on the Delving Bitcoin forum about it. Essentially, this is, I guess, from from a Bitcoin user's perspective, like internal plumbing stuff, but that it does solve some interesting mempool related concerns about things being included in blocks and things being evicted from the mempool, and having that be a more rational, it, using cluster mempool would be a, a more rational way of doing both of those things, but it involves a lot of interesting engineering. So if you're curious about that, take a look at cluster mempool. Mm -hmm. And then Warnet is a cool project that's come out of some of the Bitcoin core developers need to kind of have a network that you can model. Like, so, so if you think of like a test network where you can designate easily I want this many nodes, these versions, mm -hmm. and then you can set set up that topology and then just essentially hit run and it spawns all of those different nodes and they can interact in, in how they would normally interact. And you can also then set up these things called scenarios that would uh, cause, you know, for example, you could have a scenario in which a bunch of BRC20 traffic right. happens on the network and see how the nodes fall over or don't fall over as a result of that. So it's a cool uh, testing tool. So uh, that's recently been announced. I think they're working on an official um, version release, but play around with that. It's a cool tool for Bitcoiners to play with uh, P2P network. Uh, we mentioned the liquidity ads already, which is this from 281 that you have in the notes here. Mm -hmm. And then 282 I mentioned is the recap we go through January, February, all the way to December about what kind of stuff was being discussed. And then we also have some call-outs for 
different notable things. I think we have a call out for different soft work discussion per our earlier discussion. So take a look at what's been discussed this year. It's a good way to get refresh yourself uh, from a high level view of what's happening in Bitcoin and Lightning. So we put out the equivalent of a 250 page book worth of content Jesus. in the newsletter. We put out 50 plus hours of podcast. So if your folks who are listening to this pod are, are falling asleep, not enough, then you can plug in the Optech feed and you'll definitely get some sleep there. And we also have transcription on our podcast, which is something like... It's a great, uh, just, yeah. I mean, people should, you know, listen to that and subscribe to the mailing list, like, immediately. Don't don't forget, because it's uh, it's a lot more information that you get out of here, <laughs> it, you know, and it's, like, all about core. There is no best source of core information in a digestible manner than than what you guys do. And one of the interesting things about the podcast is that we've actually been fortunate enough to get the individuals who are making these uh, mailing list posts or these proposals or these software changes onto the podcast to talk about their idea firsthand, yep. which I think we've been very fortunate enough to have them. I think we had over 60 different guests this past year. And we, if you, if you don't want to listen to it, you're also, we have a transcript that comes out within the week of the podcast being recorded. I mean, that's a human transcript and she does a great job of transcribing that. I think we had a half, near a half million words transcribed of these podcasts, which helps people who don't want to listen. Um, and it also helps with garnering search results. So there's obviously a lot of conversation that will show up in Google now. You'll start seeing Optech uh, transcript references, which is great. So we're patting ourselves on the back there. So check out that uh, year in review 2023. Nice. Well, let's see here. I think this might be a wrap. Let's see here. What else we got? Uh, oh, Jesus. There's all the news. I'm not going to go over it. <laughs> I think we're done. We're done for today. There is a million more things for you to read on the show notes for, for the ones who want to go dumpster diving here. Johnny puts a lot of effort into this. There's a fuck ton of information here. There's all the things we rushed through it. We've been at this for two hours and 10 minutes. Uh, we have other things to do. So uh, thank you so much. Mike, any final thoughts? No, thanks. Thanks for having me. Good discussion. Thanks for putting this content out there. I will actually use these show notes as a reference when I do the client services section for the newsletter in the next month. So thanks to you and Johnny for putting this together as one of my sources of information about what's happening with Bitcoin software development. And thanks for having me on. Amazing. All right, guys, uh, you have a fantastic day. And uh, kids, don't USF things you can't back. <laughs> Take care. Cheers. Thanks for listening. For more resources, check the show notes. We put a lot of effort into them. And remember, we don't have a crystal ball. So let us know about your project. Visit Bitcoin.review to find out how to get in touch. Mm-hmm.